Welcome back, folks. Uh, this is a video lecture to support chapter six. Uh, chapter six is all about cytoplasmic signaling circuitry uh, that found within the cytoplasm of a typical mammalian cell. So what we need to do is just understand from the previous readings of chapter five and chapter four that receptors are normally located at the surface of the cell because most of these signaling molecules are protein-based. Uh, therefore, they're hydrophilic and unable to cross the plasma membrane. But also remember, there are other um, receptor molecules that are located in the cytoplasm and the nucleus, and we'll mention them very quickly at the end. The purpose of these receptors is to transmit signals from the outside world into the cell itself. And in that sense, they can be considered as a signal transduction pathway, where the signal is converted from a chemical signal to a mechanical signal uh, of some type within the cell. The big question is, once these signals are received, how is the activity of the cell altered, both in normal cells and in tumor cells? And that's the main purpose of this chapter. So the learning outcomes, they support that particular perspective. So explaining things is very important. So when you're doing your reading, make sure you're building a database of knowledge, not memorization, but knowledge on how different systems are compared. So comparison is the big key. Otherwise, we could tell you what happens in a few pages, uh, not the 60 pages that are needed in this case. So explaining things about different circuits are very important. Uh, it's more than likely that these are the main circuits that are normally responsible for the cell cycle and then cell behavior. Some of the hallmarks of cancer cells can then be relayed back to the way that these circuits work. So that's very important that we understand this. And of course, defects in these circuits at any particular point could alter the behavior of said cell so that it becomes a problem. On the second page, we're gonna go and look at jacks and stats. You may have heard of them uh, on advertising on the TV uh, for commercials selling particular types of therapeutic drugs uh, to treat cancer patients. And then we'll revisit the WENT pathway and we'll explain how integrins uh, work uh, with the uh, receptor tyrosine kinases, again, from the perspective of within the cell itself. Where do we begin? Well, let's begin with a quick overview. So you, we'll see here that the number of protein coding genes, so this does not include uh, RNA coding genes, uh, the number of protein coding genes it's still a contention issue because we don't know exactly how many there are because of variation in their uh, structure. But let's assume that they are between 20 and 25,000. So those genes are responsible in the genome of a human being for making proteins. But when we analyze cells, we find over 100,000 different proteins. So it's impossible for one protein to come from one gene. Then the question becomes, what's going on? So you may have thought about alternative splicing. That's one way. How about post-transcriptional processing? So the RNA, the messenger RNA is processed in some way or RNA interference uh, intercepts the messenger RNA and then modulates the amount of a particular protein then we have post-translational modification where chemical groups can be added or removed from proteins to change their shape. And as you know, the great saying, uh, shape dictates behavior. We do know now that we're finding more and more of these signaling proteins within cells. So far, more than 20,000 proteins have been identified in various tissues. So that complicates our analysis. As it says at the end of the chapter, um, and we've said that before, 
the inside of a cell doesn't have linear pathways where A goes to Z uh, and one goes to 25. Uh, it's like a cobweb, a, a spider's web, where one pathway may intercept and diversify into multiple pathways or be joined by other pathways. So by changing something on one side of the cobweb, by shaking that, you may eventually end up shaking different parts of this cobweb in ways that we're still learning. So that's the big thing. This is a work in progress. And what you're gonna learn in this chapter is our current understanding of some of the systems, some of the more common systems that have come to our attention. So keep that in mind. So let's focus in on these proteins. So each shape and each colored shape, I should say, would be a player, a protein that's involved in some type of signal transduction, a circuit. And some circuits are independent of other circuits. So for instance, if these four at the top uh, were selected by a particular signal arriving at the surface of the cell, it could be that the pathway is linear. It could branch and interact with another pathway that's activated by a different ligand. Therefore, you're beginning to understand the cobweb, the spider's web analogy, okay? But we'll do our best uh, to at least understand these simple linear pathways. And then near the end of the chapter, we'll start then looking at how they can be superimposed in this manner. So what are the most important things? Well, each protein, just like you may have learned in previous courses, has specificity. It has certain ligands that it can interact with, and then it has certain shapes or substrate molecules that it can influence. So specificity of proteins is very important. So this blue protein here will be specific in this particular example to interacting and being activated by the black square, but not by any of the other three circular shapes. And that protein itself will then go on to interact with the green triangle and nothing else within the cell. So that's where your specificity comes from, right? And the second thing you see is proteins do, as the chapter says, they act as a fire bucket parade, <laughs> a bucket parade so that uh, one protein activates another and another protein activates another, just like a set of dominoes toppling over. But just like with dominoes, you can have one domino topple two dominoes or more and then lead to independent pathways. And those pathways may come together at a different place. So the domino analogy is quite good. Although we don't know uh, how to arrange the dominoes within a cell because it's so very complicated. But signaling to other proteins and then eventually uh, to the transcription factors in some cases or to rearranging the cytoskeleton in other cases, or by changing the cell morphology in yet other cases, maybe the consequences of these pathways. But each pathway could be considered like a computer circuit where decisions are made based on the actual situation in that cell at that moment in time, okay? So these are very clever circuits that respond uh, to cellular uh, situations, environments. So let's keep that in mind, right? So what's the take home message so far? Well, we can say that many cancer cells have imbalances in these signaling pathways. So that's what we're finding. We look at normal cells and we compare them to a multitude of cancers. And we generally find in the vast majority of cases that there are perturbances in the either the quantity or the relationships between these pathways compared to the normal. So there's a great clue as, as to how cancer cells uh, may actually manifest uh, their mutations. The next slide simply says that we learned from experimentation that certain situations result in certain outcomes. For instance, uh, when a signal is received by certain cells, one of the responses can be a quick response uh, that takes place within, say, 15 minutes. So we call those early responses. Then if you wait long enough, that initial response may either die down 
and be replaced by a, another response by the cell, maybe an hour or two later. Or maybe that initial response lingers for a while uh, before something else happens. So there's a temporal factor, a time factor, right? So what a cancer cell made or a normal cell may do initially may not be exactly what it does a few hours later. So we can see there could be a wave of biochemical activity within the cell initiated by the binding of that ligand to its cell receptor. And in this case, uh, these experiments that were done, uh, they revealed the existence of early activity at the DNA level. So we call those immediate early genes that are activated. And then we have subsequently uh, delayed early genes. And then we may even have genes that are uh, activated at a, at a later point in time too, like a, a triple wave of activity. Uh, experiments using uh, poisons like, such as a uh, cyclohexamide, which bind to transcription, sorry, I should say translation factors, um, EF1s and EF2s uh, that bind to the small subunit of the ribosomes in your cells can inhibit uh, de novo protein synthesis. So all new protein synthesis is shut down, but we monitor the cell at the same time, we do notice that the immediate early genes, i.e. Gs, uh, are activated. So that means they must already have all the protein machinery uh, sitting in proximal location, ready to go. So it's like the proteins are already made and they're waiting to be activated by probably a change in their shape or by binding to other proteins rather than being made by ribosomes uh, when, when, uh, when initiated, right? The same cannot be said of delayed early genes. These do require um, de novo protein synthesis. So uh, cyclohexamide, cyclohexamide um, does interfere uh, with those genes activations. So as, as the figure suggests, um, some of the products of these immediate early genes are gonna be proteins themselves that are gonna then initiate some type of um, second round of protein synthesis. And then those proteins will act as transcription factors to turn on a second wave of genes and possibly a third wave, right? So this question comes up. Uh, does the functional activation of these early genes depend on the level of protein in the cell? So cells that have a lot of protein versus cells that contain less of that same protein. And then we can compare normal cells to cancer cells to see if there's a difference already uh, at the time um, the cells are examined. It could be that cancer cells have elevated levels of these proteins compared to normal cells. And that gives us a clue as to how cancer cells have come into existence, okay? And then of course, the last question here is how are these mitogenic signals conveyed from the cell surface to the nucleus in this particular case? So learning about all that is important. So there's two things going on here, you can see. Uh, one is localized change, where that happens in the same geography. And then there's a second factor where these protein factors migrate uh, throughout the cell and they change their localization, their geography. So we can also investigate those parameters. So here we go, looking at particular examples of this very generalized scheme that we want to investigate. So receptor tyrosine kinases, as we know, are modular in their design. So the polypeptides uh, or the protein subunits, uh, they have defined locations that make up domains and those domains have particular functions. Can we correlate those functions with the signal transduction process? And the answer is yes. And do we find patterns amongst different types of these uh, signaling molecules? And the answer again is yes. So what does that suggest? Well, it suggests that during evolutionary development, maybe the ancestral cells of metazoans, i.e. single-celled creatures, 
they were able to control their own cells using very simple processes that were then amplified, duplicated, or somehow replicated into what we have today. So common elements have been used again and again in different systems. As we said previously, uh, Mother Nature doesn't like to invent something new. What she likes to do is tinker with what already exists by either changing it slightly or mixing and matching. And mixing and matching is very relevant when it comes to domains, as you'll see there. So receptor tyrosine kinase. So let's focus in on the SARC receptor. Uh, sorry, the SARC protein. Uh, it's not the receptor itself. It's the protein that interacts with the receptor at the next level. So looking at this protein, uh, we find that it has a major domain here called SH1, SARC homology domain number one. Then it has another independent domain here called SH2. And then it has a final domain here called SH3. So do these domains give us a clue as to how signal transduction works? And the answer is yes. So the SH1 domain is broken up into two parts, two lobes, they call it. Uh, the end lobe up here, and it's best to look over this side now for the same. And then we have that lobe connected through some um, uh, linking uh, amino acids to the C domain, C, C, C lobe domains, I should say. And what do these do? Well, these have a high degree of homology between different receptor tyrosine kinase. And maybe uh, this is the activation site of this particular protein. And indeed, the active site here is important in interacting either with uh, neighboring molecules or with other target molecules that may drift into this location. So the general process here is you, uh, phosphate groups are taken from ATP and then using the catalytic activity of this particular domain, they can be transferred onto target proteins. And we, we read about that in chapter five. But let's focus in on the other two domains. So the SH2 domain is the one that recognizes the tails of the receptors. So there must be something about this that can discriminate between a receptor that's on, that's phosphorylated, and a receptor that's off non-phosphorylated. And indeed, there are amino acids here that actually bind to those um, uh, phosphotyrosines uh, that we find on the receptor tails. We'll see that on the next slide. And then we have the SH3 domain, which can also influence um, the specificity of binding. So both these domains have to bind appropriately with enough affinity in order to trigger a change in the active site of this particular protein. So you can see we have a knock-on effect even within a single protein, where something happens on one end of the protein and then it's reflected at an opposite side of the same protein. So pretty ingenious, I would say, right? So let's focus in on these uh, binding sites. So we see that the SH2 groups, that's what we have here, um, is consists of a couple of alpha helices and a couple of sets of beta pleated sheets. And the important thing is that there are some tyrosine residues in here and those can get phosphorylated and therefore change the configuration of this region. That will then have a knock-on effect onto adjacent regions, i.e. Uh, SH1. When we look at this, in a more graphical nature, we find that there's a binding site for neighboring amino acids, and then there'd be a binding site for phosphotyrosine. So the tail of the receptor will be here, and this will only bind if the tyrosine at that location is phosphorylated, in addition to the neighboring amino acids, maybe a couple that will then have to fit into this pocket when all three are in the appropriate configuration on the tail of the receptor, will this domain bind 
and then pass the signal onto the catalytic uh, domains of this particular uh, protein. Okay, you can see uh, the specificity is governed uh, mainly by this region here, and is initiated by that region. So we find that this pattern repeats itself, uh, where this may be common, but then the spacing between the two of these may vary, and then the specificity of that may be unique to a particular segment of the cytoplasmic tail of the receptor molecule. So here is that generalized overview, right? So in panel A, we have a PDGF beta receptor that will bind its ligand. And when we examine the tails domains of the receptor, we find that at various locations, and the locations are given in, uh, in the codon numbers here, we find that because of the sequence of amino acids, even though phosphorylation is common to those tyrosines, the neighboring amino acids are very important. Therefore, SARC will only bind here if these two um, tyrosines are phosphorylated. And then we have other proteins that can bind in various places. And we'll talk about these other proteins um, in subsequent slides and also in subsequent chapters. But you see, this is a completely, well, it's not a completely different receptor. It's a cousin of a PDGF beta. This is EGF, right? Epithelial growth factor receptor. And its tail has its own sequence of uh, tyrosines that can get phosphorylated. And then they attract uh, different um, partner proteins, uh, depending on the surrounding sequence, which can vary. You can see here, that's going on, right? So STAT35 can bind to two locations, and you can see most of the others are binding to single locations along the tail, cytoplasmic domain. So two things are happening here. You have specificity. Only those proteins will bind in that region and not down here. And then you have uh, the localization of those proteins close to this environment. So these proteins are held in place by these attractions, and that enhances the likelihood of something else happening, either with respect to the, uh, uh, the cytoplasmic base of the plasma membrane or the vicinity of neighboring uh, proteins uh, to this environment. So specificity and location are very important. Uh, uh, let me mention, when these uh, are not phosphorylated, then these proteins will not interact and they'll be floating around randomly and not localized to this region. And they themselves may be in a off configuration until they bind uh, to phosphorylated uh, regions of these tails. So SARC uh, is normally in normal cells uh, inactive and uh, under the right conditions, it can be pulsed, a uh, pulsed to come on for a pulse of activity. And then it's supposed to become quiet again. Uh, we do find in uh, many cancer systems, many cancer cells, that the activity of SARC uh, is not regulated and it's constitutional. So that means constitutive, right? That means it's on all the time. So let's take a deeper look at SARC. So here's that cartoon. This reflects uh, the SH1 domain with the lobe, the two lobes, the N lobe and the C lobe. And what we're trying to learn is how is the catalytic activity of this protein regulated? And it's all to do with mechanical changes. So under normal circumstances, uh, the catalytic uh, loop, uh, this activation loop is preventing the catalytic site from interacting with its target. And we can see here that amino acid 527 is phosphorylated and it binds to the SH2 domain. And then there's another loop here that is going to inactivate SH3. So that's what the protein looks like in its normal unactivated state. Now, how does it become activated? Well, it goes through a transitional phase. So first this happens, and then the protein becomes activated, right? And remember, we're trying to get the uh, catalytic cleft, that region there between the yellow and the orange, to become available to molecules which are drifting around uh, in, in that space. So the first thing that happens is that this association between SH2 
and there's a phosphotyrosine uh, is broken by the preference of the blue domain for the tail of the receptor. Okay, so this is your PD, uh, PDGF receptor, and this is the location on the tail to which it will bind. And you can see the specificity of binding is dictated by the SH3 domain, and the general binding is dictated by the SH2 domain. So SH2 prefers this over any kind of phosphorylation at position 527. So when this binds here, if it exists, then it will cause this to bind, then it'll cause this to lose its phosphate, and that then has a knock-on effect on the SH1 domain. The SH1 domain then has a further phosphorylation taking place at amino acid 416, and that draws the, uh, the activation loop away from the catalytic cleft, therefore now making this available to its target molecules. So the active site of the, this protein here, or this domain, becomes available, and then it can now interact with other target molecules, therefore perpetuating uh, the signal uh, into the next phase of the signal transduction system. So pretty neat, as they say, and uh, pretty elegant, I think, uh, but straightforward. It obeys all the learning that we did in a previous course and understanding that is very important. So if you don't understand what's going on here, you might want to watch a quick video uh, that's available on YouTube about how SARC can become activated. So what happens next? Well, what we do know is that many proteins, when they're studied in enough detail, uh, they have very similar organization. That means they contain domains of SH2, SH3. So that suggests a very common methodology that's been replicated uh, through the evolutionary process into many proteins. And now we have lots of pathways in more complicated cells like we have compared to our ancestral single celled uh, ancestors, right? So here's just a dic uh, pictorial dictating what could happen. So here's your receptor uh, binding its ligand. That causes it to become phosphorylated through dimerization in this case. Uh, the presence of the phosphotyrosine causes this protein here to bind using its SH2 domain. That triggers the SH3 domains to bind some other protein. And that other protein now becomes activated. And then it interacts with a, another protein, in this case, turning that protein on. So this system here, uh, it's worth learning because it's pretty common. So we have to learn these names. So the name of this protein here is GRAB2. This is son of sevenless. And in certain creatures, this receptor is called sevenless, uh, as your textbook uh, eludes. And the whole point of this pathway is to activate this very important key protein called RAS. And then when RAS is activated, uh, it can then interact with a multitude of other things as we'll see shortly. Okay, so that system is very important. Is there another system? Well, there's an alternative that exists too, that also ends up activating RAS. So you'll see this a lot, uh, that certain different receptors, um, they will activate different pathways initially, but those pathways may combine at a later point somewhere in the signal transduction process. Okay, so we see an example of that. So if we go backwards, uh, RAS has been activated, just like here, by what? Seven, uh, son of sevenless, right? So SOS, so we have SOS here. What activated SOS? Well, GRAB2, GRAB2. And now the difference is this GRAB2 binds directly to the receptor, whereas this GRAB2 binds to another protein, which bound to a different receptor. So you can see uh, we have two different signals coming in, but they all end up in this particular example, activating RAS. What you don't see is it could be that there's other pathways coming off here that are not coming off here. So there could be some uniqueness to this system over this end, but generality over here. 
But also remember the degree to which SOS activates this may be different to the degree to which S this SOS activates this. So you could have a dosage effect too. So all these complications, unfortunately, we have to remember. Because that's part of learning about how cancer works. Just to go through this slide very quickly, here's a list of seven different types of uh, proteins. And you can see uh, by the colors, certain domains are very common. And uh, SH2, SH3, and the kinase. And then we have some unique domains on some of these proteins that are not present on others. And in some cases, we have multitude, an amplification of a domain. Uh, in other cases, we just have a single iteration. So these are just looking back into how nature works, right? So uh, pick and choose and uh, amplification. Okay, so let's spend uh, the majority of the rest of the time looking at these examples. We have six to go through, and we're gonna start with uh, RAS, since it appears to be one of the most common ones that you find uh, in uh, broken cells, cancerous cells, tumor cells, right? So we'll look at the normal situation, and then we'll look at the situation in uh, cancer cells. So RAS, RAS protein. So straight off the bat, uh, this is just one most common interaction deciphered so far of the RAS protein. Uh, as the back of the chapter reveals, uh, more recently, RAS has been uh, investigated experimentally to be involved in a lot more pathways, but these are, seems to be the main ones, uh, both from a historical perspective and from a functional perspective. So we're gonna do this. We're gonna look at RAS and we're gonna divide that analysis into three parts, which correspond to these three colors of branches. So the RAS protein, once it's activated, will then activate RAF, right? Then RAF will activate MEC. Then MEC will activate ERK1 and ERK2. And that, that particular protein complex will then activate six other proteins in its vicinity, three of which are transcription regulators and three of which are trans, trans, now transcription regulators, I should say, right? And translation regulators. So you can see uh, these will turn on genes and these will activate um, the production of more proteins. So let's go through this and let's have a look. So these, all these are called effectors, right? because the effects of RAS being activated are then relayed down this pathway here. In all cases, uh, phosphorylation is, seems to be the key. So phosphorylation turns on a kinase activity in the preceding enzyme. So a kinase is, an, is an, a protein uh, that adds a phosphate onto itself or a partner, right? So if the partner protein downstream is phosphorylated, and then we say that the original protein upstream is a kinase, right? So RAS, RAS is a kinase that activates RAF and then the system works in that fashion. All right, so here we are looking at a more detailed perspective of that previous slide. So where do we begin? Well, we have a ligand, it dimerizes our receptor, right? So these are your receptor tyrosine kinases. And then that turns on GRAB2, which then turns on the RAS GEF, which is son of sevenness. Um, this is a very common protein, uh, which does a very similar job in different pathways. So in this case, uh, what it's gonna do, it's gonna exchange the G protein as, it's gonna exchange the G proteins, uh, GDP, um, with GTP, thereby turning that protein on. And you can see the RAS is held in place in the uh, plasma membrane uh, by a cytoplasmic loop. And the RAS protein is off in the GDP configuration. But when you have a swapping of the GDP with a fresh GTP, RAS becomes activated and it'll stay activated for a period of time that's dictated by another protein interacting with this, which then uh, removes one of the phosphates, restoring 
um, RAS back to the inactive configuration. But while active, the RAS protein interacts directly uh, with another protein called uh, MAP kinase, kinase, kinase. Uh, don't let that scare you, um, but that's the order in which they were discovered. So this kinase was discovered first, and then they discovered that that protein was being phosphorylated by this kinase. So they put a double name, and then later on they discovered yet another protein that was phosphorylating this one. Therefore, they gave that a kinase, kinase, kinase uh, title. But regardless, you see what's going on, right? So the activation of this causes this to become phosphorylated. Once this becomes phosphorylated, it becomes active, and then it targets this protein for phosphorylation. Once this is phosphorylated, it becomes active, then it targets a multitude of other proteins uh, to be phosphorylated. And those proteins then have some downstream effect on the cell. So here we see a classic signal transduction pathway, right? The chemical signal is converted into a cascade of activity. And not only do you get a relay of the signal in this fashion, in the vast majority of cases, you also get amplification. So one of these may trigger many of these. Many of these may trigger many of these. And many of these may activate many, many, many RAS proteins. And each RAS protein then activates a multitude of this. And by the time you get down here, you may have a million fold uh, amplification of this signal. So one binding here can result in a million or so uh, phosphorylation events, uh, downstream subsequent events. So this is both an amplification and a relay at the same time, in most cases. So this slide here uh, is an actual uh, paper that was published in 2006 that looks at how cancer cells differ from normal cells. And they found that the RAS protein was locked in in a particular configuration in these cancer cells compared to normal cells. So in normal cells, it's, it generates a burst of activity, then the RAS protein becomes silent. But in these cancer cells, uh, the RAS protein was continually on, so it couldn't be turned off. And we now understand how that happens, okay? And, and that's all taken care of uh, right here. So here's our RAS GEF, son of sevenless. And this other protein is a regulator. It's a type of negative controller, right? So this protein says, okay, uh, RAS can stay on for so long before this protein, NF1, turns it off, okay? And so the, the two work in unison regulating the behavior of RAS. So if there's something wrong with either the RAS so that it itself can't be turned off because the turning off switch is broken, mutated, or NF1 is missing, therefore it can't be turned off externally, then the result is the same. Whenever SOS turns on RAS, then the RAS stays on forever until it's degraded. And that can lead uh, to various uh, morphologies that resemble cancer. So this is proof that we've discovered um, a, a system that can be relayed with cancer cells, okay? So remember that. So this is a kinase, kinase, kinase pathway that results in increased transcription and protein um, translation. So let's move on to the other pathway. So this one is called the, I, uh, the PI3, I'm gonna call it IP3, uh, PI3 uh, kinase pathway. And this itself can lead to overlapping cell behaviors as well as new behaviors such as the inhibition of apoptosis. So this pathway when activated normally um, prevents the cell from uh, activating apoptosis during that proliferation event. And it also leads to an increase in the size of the cell, cell growth. At the same time, it then initiates the cell cycle. So if you put these together, it makes sense. Uh, if you want the cell to divide, then you need to turn on the cell cycle, have the cell grow in size during G1 and G2, uh, G2 and then also prevent the suicide program from killing the cell uh, during this process. So this is an important branch of the RAS protein pathway. So let's dive in a bit deeper. 
So the, so the main target is this PI3 kinase, right? So this is an enzyme. And the enzyme acts on its substrate. And what is its substrate? Well, you can see uh, the substrate is this molecule here, okay? So here, here's your PI3 kinase. Uh, that's the enzyme that's most likely uh, defective in many cancer cells, although you can get defects in other enzymes too. But let's just concentrate on that. So we have this uh, phosphatidyl inositol. So pronouncing that is a bit hard, so we just call it PI. It's a type of uh, um, glycolipid. So there's your glucose part, your carbohydrate, and there's your lipid. And it's actually part of the membrane, uh, the leaflet, the, the cytoplasmic leaflet of the membrane. So it's a minor part, but it's still uh, more than its neighbors, it's involved in signal transduction. So that's amazing that the membrane can do a multitude of things other than just transporting and uh, segregating chemistry. So anyway, uh, so the sugar part is, uh, is uh, phospho uh, <laughs> phosphorylated at one site, right there, number one. And then in the presence of other kinases, you can get alternative uh, carbons phosphorylated. This is 4,5, right? So this is a, a diphosphate. So it's called PIP2, PIP2. And then uh, you can go down this pathway to get to uh, the release. So let's just deal with this. So you can get the release of the sugar from the lipid component by the activity of phospholipase C. Okay, so phospholipase C liberates the sugar component away from the lipid component. Now this is still held in place, but this is now free to drift uh, deeper into the cytoplasm and interact with the uh, systems that are held by the cytoskeleton in those locations. So that's one pathway, right? The other pathway is to use a PI3K, right? Uh, so in this case, a, a, a kinase comes along and then it phosphorylates while still attached to the uh, lipid, uh, the sugar molecule uh, at the third carbon. So now you get three, four, five triphosphate and that's called PIP3, right? So remember the names now. So this is a PIP2 because it's got two phosphates here. This is PIP3 because it has three phosphates and this is IP3, IP3 because once you cut this off, now you have a third phosphate here, but it's different to this, which is still held in place. So, so this is a powerful um, second messenger, they call it. It's a molecule that can carry information deep into the cell and, and activate other pathways in, uh, in quite um, powerful mechanisms, right? Um, so this is a, a mobile element, whereas this is still attached, tethered to the plasma membrane. So depending on which pathway you choose, you can either release something or keep it tethered to the uh, plasma membrane. But you can see now we're getting a branching effect, right? Which branch do cancer cells use? Sometimes they use one branch, other times they use the, 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 the second branch, and sometimes they use both. So let's prove that there are some common domains that exist even at this level. And indeed, we have the target protein of uh, PIP3, right? So this is PIP3, again, tethered uh, to the membrane. And once it's uh, in this configuration here, the, the three configuration, there it is, right? Because of the activity of uh, PI3K, it now has a shape that's recognized by this protein here, right? Uh, uh, PKB, protein kinase B, also known as AKT. So this binds, it doesn't bind here, but it will bind there. And you can go back and forth between these two configurations of PIP, um, PIP3, and then PIP2. And that's, that reverse activity is uh, catalyzed by P10. So remember P10, that's gonna be very important. Remember PI3K, they work in antagonistic fashion, right? When, uh, PKB binds uh, to PIP3, it then becomes activated, and then it will then uh, cause some other type of activity uh, further downstream, right? 
So what do we know about this? Well, it's a strange protein. Um, it does promote the survival of the cell, as we said earlier, prevented by disabling or delaying the uh, apoptotic pathway. So that's your apoptosis. And it does itself uh, interact with another branch that stimulates cell uh, growth through the cell cycle. And it really does increase the size of the cell by absorbing uh, more nutrients from the surrounding media. So all these are known effects of protein kinase B. And that's illustrated by these diagrams. So these are normal pancreatic cells. Uh, these are um, uh, transformed pancreatic cells. You can see uh, they're much larger than these ones because they've gone, undergone cell growth and because of the activity of uh, protein kinase B. And we can also localize uh, the presence of P10. Remember P10 uh, takes IP3 backwards by removing the phosphate on uh, carbon three. And we can stain that up uh, in normal tissue versus a uh, um, transformed tissue. And you can see uh, uh, the P10 stains this tissue quite aggressively, but it doesn't stain this tissue. So maybe P10 is missing, it's defective in here, and that leads to the transformation of those cells, right? Or it could be that, it could be also that protein kinase B is hyperactive. It's hyperactive in these tissues than in this tissue, even though pin, uh, P10 is normal. So you, you have to look at both sides, right? Is this misbehaving or is its partner misbehaving or is the reverse enzyme misbehaving or is it a combination of those? So that's where the challenge comes in. There's so many players uh, that can be doing different things. It could be that somebody's performing better than they'd normally do in a ball game today. So that's gonna give that team some kind of advantage. Or it could be that they are underplaying the subpar. They're not playing as well. And that could give them a disadvantage. So both of those will affect uh, the outcome of the game. So that's a good way to look at it. Uh, do we know for sure uh, what different types of products that are activated by protein kinase B do? Yes, even though we're not giving you the details, uh, research has suggested, we do understand these proteins interact in some way with protein kinase B. And you can see uh, these effects can be both inhibitory and activatory. Activatory or activating is the better word, right? You can see that we have the different types, okay? And of course we have different types of cancer where we can then correlate whether the P10 is defective or the PKB. It could be either or one or both. And you can see there, um, we have discovered that in this case, in the colon carcinomas, more than 30% of them, they have a overexpression of protein kinase B. In others, like melanoma, there's a mutation in P10, as well as a methylation of P10 that reduces its activity, therefore keeping uh, the system running longer than expected. But you, if you step back a bit, you may be beginning to see a pattern here, right? Proteins misbehaving may lead to transformation and cancer. Let's look at the final pathway. And that pathway here is gonna have a general effect on the motility of the cell and its attachment to its neighbors, right? And that is then manifest through the cytoskeleton and the cytoskeleton's tethering through um, receptors uh, to the outside world and neighboring cells or the extracellular matrix. So that's what this pathway seems to be mainly responsible for. So let's dive deeper into that one. So, oh, are we gonna dive? No, not yet. We'll dive deeper into it in another chapter. Why? Because there's a lot of detail there that we need to understand, but I gave you a clue. So if something goes wrong, uh, either with the RAS or this pathway, then cells will detach from their neighbors and become more motile. 
and that's a hallmark of cancer cells. So the summary, as we said earlier, uh, we're beginning to learn more and more about how RAS protein works. And you can see uh, some of these pathways we just talked about, but there's other new ones that we are discovering all the time. Uh, so the system is very complex, but the green boxes just tell you um, the, the effects, the generalized effects on cell behavior, okay? So you get translation increase, you get transcription increase, you get changes in apoptosis, the cytoskeleton rearranges itself to form these um, 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 ligand foci. So you can attach to one cell, push that along, and then move to the next cell, so motility. And of course, uh, cell division may be uh, affected too, right? So cancer cells like to reproduce quite rapidly. So if you want to take a pause right now, uh, you could uh, uh, engage with this thought question. And the thought question is asking you to apply uh, your learning at a theoretical pharmaceutical company level, right? So if you want to take a few moments to stop the video and to engage with those three questions, at least have some idea of what the answer should be. So by pausing and considering what you've learned, not just in this chapter, but previous chapters, putting the story together, maybe you're beginning to see these bigger patterns. That's the key to learning this class. We're gonna spend uh, some time now moving on to a second system. So we've done the RAS, let's go to the Jack stats, right? So the Jack stats system, uh, how is that involved? Well, as you learned in the previous chapter, there's an alternative mechanism by which you can phosphorylate things, right? So these are not part of the receptor. They are accessory proteins that get activated when dimerization takes place, right? So these are your jacks. So uh, they, they do a, a transphosphorylation and because of that transphosphorylation, they may also go on then to phosphorylate the tails of the dimerized receptor. And now for the first time, other proteins recognize things and they can come and bind and be activated themselves. And then uh, in this particular case, uh, the presence of these phosphates on the STAT1 and STAT2 is, is a necessary event in order for them to themselves dimerize. And once they become dimerized, then they move to a different location within the cell. In this case, they translocate themselves to the nucleus. And there they have a complicated relationship with other proteins. But Eventually, they form a transcription uh, factor complex, therefore activating a few hundred genes, in fact. Okay, so we, we see this going on. So this is a very similar superficial pathway where one thing activates something else, something else activates something else. But here we see that there's a more unique pattern in that we have a dimerization and that dimerization has an impact in most cases on nuclear activity, okay? So make sure you understand that. So use the right words at the right time. Uh, think about the domains that are involved here, right? Do we have SH2 domains? Well, are we recognizing phosphotyrosines? Maybe that's the case. So maybe that's, that's the commonality between this system and the RAS system that we discussed earlier. So please uh, keep the bigger picture in mind all the time. So it's good to pause, step back, reflect, come back and continue reading, all right? So specificity is basically involved in signaling through these cytokines. And that's determined by the combination of jacks and stats that exist in interacting with the receptors. So you can have different cells or within the same cell, different systems that use different players. And that combination of players will turn on a specific system or a unique system by different amounts and at different times. So it's quite complex, but it uh, doesn't mean that we can't study it. So the, the, specificity, <laughs> the specificity of the stat interactions, right? Uh, the activation uh, is partly mediated through these SH2 domains on the 
cytoplasmic side of either the accessory protein or the receptor tail itself. So we see those patterns. So again, SH2 has been sequestered by this system because it allows that common uh, activation through uh, phosphotyrosines to take place. Okay. So here's another paper published in 2006, which proves that we are beginning to understand uh, in different types of mutations, what the defects are and how those defects can have uh, implications for transformation of cells. So here we have uh, these type of mutations. Um, and so uh, this is the wild type, I should say, right? So this is the wild type JAK2 uh, protein, and that's what it looks like. And then any mutations that take place uh, can be then correlated with a certain types of cancer. So in this case, we may have a, a small degree of uh, amplification of a small region here, and that will give a, a gain of function mutation. That means this particular copy of the gene uh, is gonna cause um, a defect in the cell irrespective of the other copy on the homologous chromosome. So this is gonna be a gain of function mutation. And as you go down here, you can see uh, there are cases of uh, amplification of the locus itself. Uh, you can have tra chromosomal translocations which break up and rejoin into fusion proteins uh, or new locations within the um, genome, uh, heterochromatin and uh, uh, euchromatin. And then we have um, other types of uh, um, hybrid proteins or chimeric proteins is the right word, right? And that may then uh, cause uh, the cell to activate its own receptor or the receptors of neighboring cells uh, because the mutation is not in the cell uh, that is transformed. The mutation is in the neighboring cell and that neighboring cell turns on the cell next door and that second cell becomes transformed. So we have examples of that level of complication. So papers like this are telling us um, that a multitude of defects can take place almost at any step in this cascade, which in itself seems to be a, a daunting task to understand, but we're beginning to understand that. Okay. So uh, cytokine signaling through interleukin-6, uh, that takes place through a JAK kinases and STATs, and you can see here how that binding causes the receptor to then impinge on the JAK kinase, which turns on the STAT3, which then gets phosphorylated, and that then goes down and activates a bunch of genes. But you can see here that there are other widely expressed um, proteins that can also be involved in triggering the same effect. So is that particular cell defective because of this system, or this system, or is it defective because of something else? Um, that's why we can have a, 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 the same type of cancer like breast cancer in different patients, but manifest in different ways because something could be wrong with any part of this pathway. But the end result is that those same genes are activated in those cancers that result in a very similar transformation of those cells. So breast cancer in one patient looks like breast cancer in another, even though the cause of the misbehavior may be different in one patient to the next, or indeed, if the tumor gets large enough within the same patient. So let's move on to look at integrins, right? So we, we said integrins are uh, membrane tethered uh, proteins, which then connect to something else physically, right? So these integrins, uh, we'll look at what happens up here in a few seconds, but let's look on the inside of the cell and we can see uh, we have, again, um, this system uh, talking to the RAS protein. So let's work backwards. So we said that earlier that one way you can turn on RAS is through the activation of a uh, RAS GEF. Yep, yeah, son of sevenness in this case. And then we have GRAB2. Okay, so we've seen this system before, but in, in, in that example, GRAB2 was binding to a PDGF beta. Now it's binding to a bridging protein called FAK. And FAK is part of the cytoskeleton, uh, the cell cortex, as we saw in chapter five. And that's connected to telin, 
and tallying is then bound to the integrand. So whenever something happens up here, then you get a trigger happening down here that turns on this system. And you can see SARC is involved here too, as well as PI through K. So it's becoming a bit of a web, isn't it? And that's exactly what we said at the beginning of this video. It's like a spider's web. So here's a more detailed understanding of the interplay between some of these proteins, by no means all of them that we have discovered, but some of them. And it's beginning to look a bit too complex, correct? But the best way to learn this is to look at one system, uh, look at alternative systems, and then compare them together and say if both systems are involved or not. So uh, you can see here we have a um, um, PI3K enzyme, we have um, RAS, we have SARC. So those are the key ones that we need to look at. And then from the previous chapter, we have the cytoskeleton uh, with the talon uh, and then the actin. And then we have the other players over here, right? So you may be thinking to yourself, hang on, I remember RAF, MEC, and ERK. Wasn't that the central pathway through which RAS was then having an effect on gene transcription and protein translation? And you will be right. So maybe that's going to change the types of proteins that are present in the cytoskeleton and uh, their proportions too. Maybe that's responsible for making uh, cells migrate or anchorage independent. So we're beginning to now understand the secrets of how cancer cells could potentially work through these generalized schemes. Okay. Uh, this picture is quite nice because it just shows you that in uh, normal development of uh, these um, um, ducts in the breast tissue, uh, certain cells uh, express uh, certain proteins that lead to a change in uh, cell behavior, ultimately leading to cell death. So the ducts are cleared of any internal cells in the lumen. Okay. Uh, but over here in, in these uh, cancers, you can see uh, that same behavior is not exhibited. And now the ducts get choked full of cells that are anchorage independent. So these cells, because they're not tethered to the basement membrane, that they will have a, a natural change that causes them to activate their suicide programs. Uh, so they're cell death. Whereas uh, in cancer cells, there's no cell death. And you get this uh, ductal uh, hyperplasia, right? and uh, the lumen gets clogged up. And the, then these cells are now anchorage independent. And eventually they may have the ability to start migrating uh, outside the breast tissue. So let's look at ERB2 protein and how it can interact with this integrin called um, beta-4, right? So here we have a normal cell system. We have junctions that keep the cells tethered to each other. And then we have normal signaling between these cells. And in this case, right, uh, the epithelial cells are basically uh, localized and attached to the basement membrane here. This is the basal surface. And there's your receptor, the RB2. And you can see uh, everything is normal. The cytoskeleton will then be attached here, and then it will be attached to the and the extracellular matrix. But uh, if you do uh, activate uh, these proteins unduly or constitutively, then uh, you can produce uh, these pro other proteins. Uh, for instance, you can produce a C-JUN uh, in increased amounts, and that can lead to not only the untethering, the untethering of the two cells, so they become anchorage independent, they can also untether themselves from the basement membrane, and they can then start dividing. And that leads to, in the case of a C. Jun cell division, and in the case of the step three activation, it leads to uh, initiation of invasion by first having the breakdown of the, uh, the cell junctions. So small changes can have large impacts in these cells. That's what we're trying to say. 
just to prove that point, we have two models here. And in the, the first model, we have this cell attached to the extracellular matrix uh, using uh, this fibronectin. Okay, so this fibronectin protein. And then we have uh, bridging proteins here, uh, the integrins that link the cytoskeleton of the cell to the fibronectin. Now, one type of a peptide that can be produced, uh, RGD, uh, it can replace it can replace the fibronectin by mimicking its behavior. And as far as that cell is concerned, it's still tethered to something uh, in the extracellular matrix, when in fact, all it's tethered to is the RG, RGD, okay? So this cell uh, is now able to uh, wander, become Anchorage independent, but as far as its cytoskeleton is concerned, it's still behaving normally. So that will not activate the suicide program. And therefore that cell will now um, pretend it uh, doesn't need to activate the suicide program, right? And in the second example, uh, we have an, a, a leukocyte, which is uh, stuck to uh, the vascular endothelial cells of the blood vessel, okay? Uh, or the lymphatic tissue. So uh, we see we have the CAM proteins, uh, the ICAMs and the VCAMs, and they are tethered to the integrins that keep that T cell uh, uh, under control. Um, because of the presence of a foreign peptide, ICAM I, uh, it can then do exactly what uh, RGD was doing here and give false signals to the cell that is still tethered. And now it's going to become um, uh, more motile, right? More mobile. So integrins are very important. Um, Missignaling or inaccurate signaling can lead to changes in cell behavior and morphology. Now let's look at the final system, the WENT, uh, the WENT uh, beta catenin. Uh, we mentioned this in the context of um, uh, colon cancers, although there are other tissues that are prone to this breakdown too. So how does this work? Well, where is uh, the different proteins involved? And we told you that there's a couple of ways in which uh, beta catenin can be involved in uh, cell biology. Uh, one is through being degraded by other proteins in chapter five. But within that same context, we also mentioned that beta catenin was also involved in anchorage of the cytoskeleton to the uh, integrins, right? So in this case, we have E. cadherin, cadherin, because herin stands for um, adherins, right? Yeah, so cadherin. And uh, we can see P120, which is just the 120th protein isolated by this group. And then we have alpha catenin, and then through those bridges, we are bound to the cytoskeleton, right? So any type of mutation in any one of these proteins can result in breakdown of the signal coming through that you are attached to something outside, okay? Uh, so you can either lose P120 or the beta catenin or the alpha catenin, and that will then untether this green structure from the cytoskeleton and therefore lead to cell mortality, right? So these are uh, cadrins are transmembrane proteins and, and they attach to actin on one side and something else on the other side. So when they dimerize like this, uh, they form a adherin junction and Peter catenin is a linker that's mechanically able to transfer the force from here through into the cell and from the cell back into the external environment. So most cancers are known to originate uh, in epithelial cells uh, and those cancers have lost uh, their ability uh, to produce these uh, cadherins and that leads to motility and cell motility is very important. Uh, so this is the classic pathway that we looked at of beta, uh, beta catenin, right? And here you can see um, 
the primary function of this pathway is to destabilize uh, the beta catenin so that it doesn't activate certain genes. But once the ligand vent uh, binds uh, to the receptor frizzled, uh, that then leads to the stabilization of uh, there's a GSK3 beta. And because three S, uh, uh, GSK3 beta is stable, uh, it leads to, uh, is unstable, sorry. Uh, it leads to the uh, um, non-destruction of the beta catenin. <laughs> so you can see what's going on. You have to get it the right way around, right? So my brain is thinking back into the images that I have. And I'm trying to get the mouth to connect with the images. Um, but I, I think I understand correctly inside my head what's going on. And so uh, when uh, GSK3 beta is uh, no longer able to perform its destructive ac activity on beta, ca beta catenin, uh, the beta catenin survives, heads into the nucleus, and they combine with other proteins to act as a transcription factor. So here we have the E coherence and the Wendt signaling interactions revealed in a bit more detail. You see that. So now we have both systems uh, together, right? So here we have the cytoskeleton engagement, and here we have the ligand dependent signaling of protein um, uh, uh, gene activation. So both of these impinge right here. So do we need both to be present or do we need one or the other? And it seems in normal tissue, we have both systems firing. Therefore you have proportional changes in the cell, uh, i.e. activation of new uh, genes uh, when the cell is tethered and there's a growth factor signal present. So explaining this is very important. So the dosage of uh, the beta catenin is very important. The dosage of the beta catenin is very important, right? So on the low levels, the cell is not dividing. and the high levels of beta catenin, which can result from either one of these two systems, uh, there's gonna be some change in the cell behavior, okay? Uh, has has, has a, a slightly more detailed information showing what this science paper found, right? So loss of the e uh that results in a rearrangement of the cell cytoskeleton in this complex way. And that generates uh, the stress fibers, which can then rearrange and produce either uh, these uh, philopodia, which are like fingers that allow the cell to now explore its environment rather than staying where it is, or there's a lamp Lamellipodia, lamellipodia, which are just the ruffles in the leading edge of the cell's uh, membrane and cytoplasm that allow the cell to move. So you can see um, this explains a gross property of tumor cells, you have cancer cells, that they can explore new environments. Okay, and we'll talk about Rho uh, a bit later on, and we'll talk about uh, PIP3 uh, again in this context when we look at cell motility in another chapter. But believe it or not, we have now reached the end of this video lecture. Uh, sorry about the length, uh, but it's really necessary that we understand this because chapters seven and eight, chapters seven and eight, which are coming up, are gonna rely on that knowledge in order to completely build the picture to the level that we need it to be built. So thank you so much. And hopefully you can answer now all of these uh, learning outcomes for this video lecture. Thank you. Bye-bye.